morning I was listening to a playlist and I was thinking, I need a new song. Sometimes I get stuck on a song and it's great and then a different day happens and doesn't fit, doesn't seem to fit. And I think the Bible gives us a little bit of reason to change the song up sometimes. It says in Psalm 98, it says the Lord, oh, I just switched it up, that's 99. <laughs> Sorry, let me go back to 98. It says, sing to the Lord a new song because God has done marvelous things. The psalmist or the songwriter is inviting us to sing a new song because sometimes the old songs aren't working anymore. Sometimes what we think about what we think isn't always accurate. Or sometimes our, our story changes or we get a new layer or a piece of information that we didn't have before. Sometimes our life actually shifts and someone we love maybe isn't in our life anymore, a relationship changes, a story, a chapter completes. And it's in those moments that sometimes we need to change the song. And God invites us to sing to the Lord a new song. But it doesn't just say, pick any old song. It says, sing of the amazing, marvelous things that God has done. And so it's kind of like an album, like where an artist will release an album and it's a retrospect of all the things. Maybe they're sad things, maybe they're difficult things, maybe they're good things, but all those things together tell a story, and that story can be about goodness. And God invites us to think back on our lives, to imagine it in the moment, and to sing a song about the marvelous things that God has done, because as we do that, it gives us this incredible empowerment to do something new, to think something new, to become something new. So I wanna invite you this morning to sing to the Lord a new song. It might have some of the same words that you've sang before, but remember that God is good and in your story and working through it. Let's pray. God, I thank you for these beautiful songs that have lasted over the years, thousands of years. We've had these words in our Bible telling us to sing a new song, to do something different, to break up the minutia, the pattern, the situation that we're in, God, to do something different so that you can show us something different. God, I know in this room, there's all sorts of emotions. There's grief, there's joy, there's anticipation, there's anxiety, there's fear about the future, there's pain about the past, there's stress about finances. There are so many things that we're holding and yet you call us to sing a new song. And the way we can sing it is by looking at you and thanking you for being good, for creating us to be good, for giving us Jesus, for giving us a reason to live, for giving us purpose, for promising transformation. There's so many things, God, we can thank you for. And so this morning, we just wanna take a moment to thank you. Thank you for what you've done even though we might not be able to see what you're doing now, we thank you for what you've done in the past. And we look forward to a future where you're able to transform us, transform our families, our relationships, our situations. You're able to give us hope. You're able to give us peace. You're able to hold us in the tender moments where we need held. You're able to do all of these things and more. So God, we just pray in anticipation of what will happen as we sing this song together. And as we sing these songs on our own, every day waking up remembering that you are good. God, we love you and we thank you and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you for being here at Somos today. We are so glad that you're here. My name is Brooklyn and we are here a part of Somos Church. Somos is a word that means we are. We are a church that exists to uncover and support the God-given value in your story. That's why we're here. We're here to do that, and we're here to do that every single day of the week. So um, church is here, but it's also there and everywhere, and we hope that you want to be a part of it. What we hear often from people in our church is that there isn't enough time to connect on the weekends, and we realize that. So we always wanna make it a point to invite you to connect with each other and to connect with us so that we can uncover and support that value that's hidden in your story. So everyone go ahead, right now there's a card right in front of you. There should be a code on that card. You can scan that code. And when you do, there will be a menu where you can select the opportunity to have coffee with one of our pastors or with one of 
each other. There are a few kind of people on that drop down list, but you can also do other things there. You can give there. You can sign up for our email there. Every week an email is given to those who would like it. Um, an email that's meant to help you grow spiritually and for you to connect with the message that's been preached here and use it and have it active in your daily life. So there's lots of good things right there. All you have to do is scan the code and you will be able to choose Times for Coffee, get that email, and also learn about other things that are happening here at our church. I also just wanna say thank you to those who give at Somos Church and who give regularly. Everyone who gives at Somos is participating in this very beautiful kingdom that we see. It's not the kind of kingdom that the world describes, but the kind that supports our neighbors and loves our neighbors and embodies the love of Jesus in our neighborhoods. So being for Lakeland, that's kind of what we are. We take the money that is given and we support the ministry that this church empowers to do work in our neighborhoods. So for example, we are part of the Lakeland Chamber of Commerce. I don't know if you know that, but Somos Church is an active member of the chamber and each time we have to renew our membership that costs a little bit of money it's an investment and because you give and because you give regularly we're able to be a member of that commerce and that commerce is what's what connects us to community partners what gives us tips about what our people need in our community and it helps us resource the schools that we serve like oscar j pope lakeland highlands middle school um lakeland high school you guys we just had the biggest party i've ever been a part of this friday at lakeland high school we celebrated over 280 80 seniors that are graduating and I got to be a part of just putting a big party together for them to celebrate the fact that a chapter in their life is coming to an end and that they made it they almost made it a few more weeks but it's been so fun to get to be there to, to get to be a part of it and your investment makes it so that we can keep doing that in really really critical ways so thank you for being a part of that thank you for loving God and loving others not just with your words but with your actions all right, today's a special treat because Mitchell is here to preach. He is gonna be talking about a really incredible subject. We talked about it a little bit beforehand, so I'm really excited to hear what God has to say to us through Mitchell. Will you help me welcome him to the stage? Thank you. Well, hey, good morning, everybody. How are we today? A couple of you guys are good, yeah? All right, let's try that again. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we today? There we go. That's what I like to hear. So I want to get started by asking you guys a question, and I want you to discuss this question amongst those surrounding you. And so the question is, who is the greatest rock band of all time? So take a moment and discuss with someone around you, who is the greatest rock band of all time? Let me hear you guys shout out a couple of those rock bands. Let's hear, who is the greatest rock band? The Beatles, boys to men. Okay, come on, come on. Who else? We got the Beatles, we got boys to men. Red Hot Chili Peppers, the Eagles. Yeah, that comes from my dad and my father-in-law. They're big Eagles fans, right? Right, it's an interesting question, right? And some of you guys may have discussed the Beagles, right? Surprised we didn't hear anything about the Rolling Stones maybe, okay. Frank over here, yeah, Rolling Stones, right? Maybe Queen could have been up there too, right? I'm a big fan of Queen. And so the reason I ask you guys that question is because I read a book uh, a little while ago um, by a guy named Chuck Klosterman, and the title of the book was What If We're Wrong? And what he attempts to do in the book is look at the present as if it were the past. And he asks that same question of who is the greatest rock band of all time? And he kind of discusses all the different measurables that we may have to decide that, but ultimately comes to who we say the greatest rock band of all time is today might not be who people say the greatest rock band of all time is 50 years from now or even 100 years from now, which is interesting to me. He also brings up another example. He discusses the book Moby Dick. How many of you guys have read the book Moby Dick? A few of you in the room, right? It's considered a, a great American novel, right? It changed the landscape of literature. 
But what you may not know about the book Moby Dick is that Herman Melville published the book in 1851. He died in 1891. So 40 years went by. He believed it was probably one of his greatest pieces of work. Yet, in the 40 years after he wrote the book, before he died, he only sold 5,000 copies of that book. It was a huge failure. Nobody liked the book. Nobody received the book. Yet, 30 years later, after his death, after World War I, Moby Dick had an incredible resurgence, and so did Herman Melville. And Moby Dick was able to connect with the audiences through the parallels of war and evil, which helped catapult the book to becoming a literature masterpiece. And so what Chuck Klosterman does in this book and asking all these different questions is he's kind of speaking to this idea that our experience breeds meaning. And so we are biased by our experiences in the present, yet whenever time will go on and people are able to look back separate from that experience, they may have a, a different view to some of the things that we felt so positive about. So shaping our perception and understanding of people, things in the world around us, our experience does that. That's why Moby Dick became literature, literary royalty eventually. It's the reason that right now we feel so connected to our choice of the greatest rock band of all time, right? So maybe we listened a little bit to a little bit of Michael Jackson earlier as the band warmed up today, right? The king of pop. But there's some of you in the room that would say that Taylor Swift is the queen of pop and that she might be the greatest pop star of all time, not Michael Jackson, right? Because we're, we're connected through our experiences and through our biases, but decades, centuries from now, when people look back and see, they'll have a completely different perspective that they'll be able to speak into it. And so I wanna talk about that idea today as I ask that same question. What if we're wrong? What if we're wrong about God? It's a pretty terrifying question, right? You guys are probably shaking in your seats. Don't worry, we're not gonna talk about whether or not heaven or hell exists. We're not gonna try to prove the existence of God today, right? But I wanna talk about our experience that we have in this world, how that relates to our relationship with God and ask the question, what if we're wrong? What if we're wrong about God? And so I invite you today into a place of humility, into a place of curiosity as we dive into Genesis chapter three to the very beginning, our first interaction with God, God's interaction with humanity as we ask this question and, and see what we can learn today. So it's a pretty simple recap of what's happened so far. God's created everything. He's given man and woman dominion and power, rule over everything. And there's one stipulation, there's one rule, there's one comment that God has. He says, there's this tree that's the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from that. Everything else you can eat from. Just don't eat from this one tree. And that's where we pick up in Genesis chapter three, starting in verse one. It says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God say that you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man said to his, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. 
But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent tricked me and I ate. Recently as a staff, we've been learning about the way that our brains receive and process information through what Coy has been able to do with the Allender Center, the School for Psychology and Theology. And what we've been learning through Coy's training is that when we experience something and our brain takes in that information, there are progressive questions that that information passes through. The first question is, am I safe? That when we receive information, our brains are trying to decide, am I safe right now? It's our fight or flight response that many of us experience, and it happens just like that. It's a funny story. We uh, were at Starbucks the other day for our staff meeting. We're there every Thursday pretty much taking over Starbucks at Southgate. So if you ever want to see everybody on staff together and figure out if we actually do work, you can come to Starbucks on Thursday. We'll be there taking over Southgate Starbucks. But we're there and we're having our meeting and we sit at one of the big tables that's right there in the middle. And we're sitting there and I'm on one side of the table that faces where all the baristas are and there's someone sitting next to me, I can't remember who, and I think Romeo was across the table from me and Tori might have been across the table from me as well. Lonnie could have been across the table. And we're sitting there and we're in the middle of our staff meeting and all of a sudden I see Romeo and I think I see Tori out of the corner of their eye look left and look back and they kind of like froze. And so out of curiosity, I just took a turn to the right and looked and I saw somebody walk into Starbucks wearing a ski mask and my heart drops. I'm like, oh my gosh, what's about to happen? And he is on a beeline to the front counter and you can see the tension in Romeo, you can see the tension in Tori and I'm watching him out of the corner of my eye but still trying to do our staff meeting and then he turns left and he starts walking down, still moving so quickly with this ski mask on, getting closer to us, and my body is like frozen now. Pretty sure I'm just saying the same words over and over and over and over and over again because my mind can't think, can't process, right? Romeo, Tori, they're all kind of frozen. And then he does this. He gets to the counter and he grabs a drink and he turns around and he walks out. And at that moment, Tori and Romeo took a deep sigh of relief and they started laughing and our staff meeting was entirely interrupted. And we all kind of just took a sigh of relief and we're like, oh my gosh, (laughs) whew. Romeo's like, I bet that martial arts was about to come back in at me. I didn't know what I was about to have to do in this moment, right? That's our fight or flight response, right? It was probably just a 20 second experience of this person walking into the room. And I've never been in a place where something like that has happened before. Something drastic has happened when someone's come in to rob or to do something insane like that. But all of a sudden, right, my body is taking in this information and so quickly eliminating my ability to think clearly, just trying to determine, am I safe in this space, in this environment right now or not? Do I need to get up and fight this person or do I need to get up and run out of this place? Right, so the first thing that our brains are trying to do when it receives information is process, am I safe? The second part of of, uh, the information passing through our brains is trying to process then, am I loved? Once you can determine if I'm safe in this situation, then in your interactions, you're trying to understand, am I loved? Is this a place where I can find joy and delight? Is this a place where I can flourish? Is this a place where I can be free and be me and know that it's okay? Am I loved? And when I think of these two questions that are wired into our brains to process information that we receive, I think it reveals the most basic purpose and desire of humanity. We were created 
to feel safe and loved in this world. One of the deepest longings within our soul is to live in this kind of relationship with our creator. We were created by God to live in a safe and loving relationship with him. It's embedded deep within us. That is the deepest longing that we have in our soul. And we even experience the same desire in our everyday relationships, a reflection of that, right? We were created to be in relationship with God and others to find safety, peace, and love. And so from an early age, that's how we begin to perceive and understand the world around us. Through these questions, am I safe? Am I loved? The problem is that we live in a broken world amidst broken people. And so our core experiences teach us the opposite. Rather than perceiving the world and the people around us as safe and loving, we experience brokenness. And this brokenness teaches us that this world, that the people in it are not always safe. They're not always loving. And our reaction to that then is to try to protect ourselves so that we can survive and we shut ourselves off from relationship with those around us. That is a really difficult place to be where your strongest desire is to find a safe and loving relationship while your core experiences tell you that people are not always safe or loving. What are you supposed to do with that? How are you supposed to find peace? How are you supposed to find freedom? How are you supposed to flourish in this world, in the communities that you belong to, when your strongest desire, what you were created for, is unable to be met because it doesn't feel safe, it doesn't feel loving where you're at? And so we withdraw, and we protect, and we guard, and we hide just so that we can survive. And there's a couple of reasons that I bring all of that up into this story of Genesis 3, because before you ever heard about God, before you could ever form an understanding of God, that is the reality of your experience in this world. And so when you come to read the Bible, when you come to engage with God, you bring all of those experiences with you. It's possible for you to be unbiased when you approach the Bible. As you begin to read the stories, your brain starts connecting information from your past, information from your relationships, information from your experiences with the information that you are reading, with the information that I'm sharing with you. And that heavily shapes and influences then your understanding and your perception of God. Just like it does with who we think the greatest rock band is, just like it does when we decide who is the greatest author, What's the best book? What's the greatest movie, right? Our experience is breeding the meaning and shaping our understanding of those things around us. And the same thing happens to God. And so let's process that for a moment in the context of Adam and Eve's interactions in Genesis chapter three, because we see it start to happen here. Adam and Eve knew only of good, Everything in the garden was good. They hadn't eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, so all that they knew was good. So of course they would trust each other. Of course they would trust the serpent because they had no reason not to. All they knew was good. So when the serpent says, it's okay for you to eat of that tree, when Eve sees that that tree looks good, when Adam follows Eve to that tree and watches Eve take the fruit and eat it, when Eve shares it with Adam, all they know is good. They have no reason not to trust. They have no reason to understand brokenness at that moment. So of course they would take it. And it's in the moment that they eat the fruit that now they don't only know good, but now they know evil. It's in that moment that now they know brokenness. What would that feel like? All they knew was good. 
And in a moment now, they know what it feels like to be insecure. In a moment, they feel, they know what it feels like to doubt. They know what it feels like to have shame. They know what it feels like to have broken trust. Like they know what betrayal feels like now. Process all of that in this moment for them. They can't trust the serpent anymore who they thought they could trust. They can't trust each other now who they thought that they could trust. They probably can't even trust their own desires, their own wants, their own needs. Everything has just been shattered. And it's in that exact moment that God enters the story. And what do they do? They run and they hide. Because everything they thought they knew, everything they thought they trusted, everything they thought was good has now just changed. So now what reason do they have to believe the same thing is true of God? And so their bodies, their brains, their reaction is to run and to hide and to protect themselves from further brokenness, even in their relationship with God. Because everything else has fallen apart. Their experience has now just brought new meaning and new insight into all of their relationships. So it now changes the dynamic of their relationship with God. They carry their experiences and they project it onto God as one that is unsafe and unloving because the serpent was now unsafe and unloving because their spouse, they themselves were unsafe and unloving. Their own desires within them were unsafe and unloving. And they projected onto God to try and protect themselves from more brokenness. And I think that every one of us can probably relate to that idea in our own experiences, but even when we read Genesis chapter three, because when we read this story again, our brains are connecting our own past experiences with it. And for many of us, we could say in this story, God does not feel safe or loving because whatever experiences we have had, whatever feelings of betrayal, whatever feelings of of brokenness that we have experienced, we can bring that into this story. And if we're honest with ourselves, God probably feels like someone that is angry to you God feels like somebody who is probably frustrated, somebody who's upset, who's wrathful, who's maybe vengeful, who's coming to bring on more punishment, more shame, maybe more belittlement, right? Like when we hear God ask those questions, we can't help but think of people in our lives who have been in authority over us when we've made a mistake that have come to just heap on more shame and punishment onto us, not really wanting to know the answer to the questions, but just wanting to make us feel smaller and feel more shame in our lives. We bring that experience into our reading of this story, and that's how we begin to perceive God. Our experiences with the people in our lives shape our perception of God. And when God enters into our story, we are reminded of the most broken and hurt parts of ourselves. And so we cover up and hide them from God to try and protect ourselves, just like Adam and Eve tried to do, because that's the only way that we've been able to survive. And it's at that moment that I wanna ask you the question again, What if we are wrong? What if my understanding of God is wrong? What if God isn't like people? What if God is better? What if we're wrong? I bring that up because in Genesis chapter three, verse 21 and 22, it says this. It says, in the Lord God, made garments of skins for the man and for his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, see, the humans have become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now they might reach out their hands and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. And so God removes them from the garden And I think that this is actually a most surprising moment 
many of us see this as God's punishment on Adam and Eve for their mistakes, but what I see here is God shows kindness and compassion. Can't you feel the compassion of God recognizing the brokenness, the reality of what Adam and Eve are facing, seeing the danger of them reaching out and eating from the tree of life and eating in that broken state and living there forever? And so out of compassion, God moves in kindness to remove them. God clothes their nakedness. He comforts their shame. He removes them from the garden so that they won't have to know that brokenness and that shame forever. Adam and Eve were wrong about God. What if we're wrong too? What if the betrayal, the shame, the embarrassment, the confusion, the wrath, the punishment, the silent treatment that we've received from others is not the same response we get from God? Instead, what if God wants to offer you kindness and protection? If we could begin to see God as one who offers kindness and protection, then we might be able to see the beauty of God moving towards Adam and Eve in the garden in love rather than wrath or anger. He's coming to spend time with his beloved creation, not coming to punish them. He's not somebody who's been in another room, who's seen a mistake, who's heard a mistake, and now is coming to investigate and find out. He's someone who's coming in love and kindness to spend time with you because you are his beloved. We might see the curiosity of God to seek understanding in what Adam and Eve were experiencing rather than questioning them in condemnation. He's not coming to condemn them with his questions. He's coming to find understanding for what's happening within them, what's happening between them, what's happened now between them and God. And then we might be able to see the desire of God to restore and repair what has been broken. Protecting Adam and Eve from an eternity of brokenness rather than punishing them. Genesis 3 serves as a symbolic and a prophetic picture of our experience in this world that at some point in your life, you were deceived. All you knew was good and innocence. And then evil and brokenness entered your story and it's not your fault. Broken relationships, broken trust, shame, embarrassment, deception, insecurity, betrayal. In order to survive, you've had to protect yourself. But that is not what you were created for. You were created for safety and love in the presence of your creator. And the ways that you've tried to protect yourself keeps you from experiencing the kindness, the repair, the healing that God wants to bring near to you. I think one of the things I love most about what happens in Genesis 3, 21, is that we see one of the first sacrifices to cover the sin, to cover the shame, to cover the brokenness of humanity done by God which points even from the beginning to God's plan to restore and redeem humanity in Jesus. It's always been his desire. It's always been his plan to restore and repair that which has been broken so that you can be welcomed back into the garden and with healing, with wholeness, into a place into a relationship where you can flourish in who you were created to be. Today, I want you to know that God sees you and God comes to you in kindness. That God comes to offer you protection and care for your story. 
that God can hold together what you cannot. That God can heal, redeem, and restore that which has been broken. And it starts when you invite the kindness of God into the unkind parts of your story. It's the beauty of Genesis three again, is that God comes into the middle of the brokenness to be with Adam and Eve, because that's where the healing needs to take place. As hard as it is to go into the broken parts of your story, the hurt parts of your story, the painful parts of your story where people have let you down, where people have failed you, where people have betrayed you, that's where God wants to go to begin repair and healing in your life which will begin to redeem and restore even your relationship with him so that you can find safety and love and begin to flourish. And so I wanna give you that chance now today to begin to invite God into the unkind parts of your story. And so as we close, I'm gonna ask you to stand. And I want you to close your eyes and I want you to just take a deep breath. I want you to pay attention to your heartbeat right now. Try to slow your breathing. And I want you to envision in your mind a safe place. wherever that may be that you feel peace, that you feel free, where that weight can fall off of your shoulders, where your mind can be at peace and be calmed and be still. Find that space right now. And in that space, I want you to just, if you can let yourself begin to feel and think about the broken parts of your story, the hurt parts, the people who have failed you, the people who have let you down, those feelings of betrayal, those feelings of deception, the broken trust, for a moment, just feel that if you can let yourself. And can you just hear God coming to that place right now? Asking, where are you? not because he's angry, but because he wants to be with you. He wants to draw near. Will you invite God to come and find you there? We take a moment and have a conversation with him about what you are feeling. It's asking what's happening, what happened. Invite his kindness into the broken part of your story. God, we come to you with pain. God, we come to you with shame. God, we come to you with brokenness. We come to you with heavy hearts. We come to you with scars. God, we come to you with longing for safety and love. God, we come to you for longing and what we were created for, and who we were created to be. God, we've been running and we've been hiding and we've been covering up and we've been protecting for so long. Afraid of what might happen, 
if we let others in and afraid of what might happen if we let you in. But God, you come to us in kindness and compassion. So God, would you come and begin to heal the broken parts of our story? God, will you come and begin to mend our hearts? Will you come to begin to repair our minds? Will you come to tend to our scars that feel like they've been ripped open time and time again? God, may we find healing and wholeness right now in this space, in this moment. God, will we allow ourselves to trust for a moment that you are safe, that you are loving, that you are good, that you, God, are not like others, that you are better. God, we invite your kindness into the, the broken and the hurt parts of our story, to the unkind parts of our story, God. Heal us and make us whole. We love you and praise you. Pray this in your name. Amen.